but we've also received word that Pastor Sam Walker's son-in-law, one of his children, whose name is Gideon, and their last name is Trevino, Gideon Trevino, has been uh, suddenly rushed to the hospital. And so Pastor Ron asked us to pray for little Gideon, all right? And let's just go to God in prayer right now as Pastor Casey comes to prepare to give us the word this morning. Amen? So, Father, we just uh, we pray for Gideon, Lord, today. We ask you, Lord, we just put him in your hands. Father, we just ask for your healing touch upon him, Lord, and your safekeeping, Lord, upon him. Bless him, Lord, and heal him and raise him up, Father God. And, uh, Lord, we trust that, Lord, he is in your precious hands, that you love him unconditionally, and that, Lord, you're going to give the doctors wisdom and grace, and, a, and just amazing healing will come to him in Jesus' name. Bless uh, Josh and uh, his wife, Lord God, as they, they seek you together, Lord, for the health of their son. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. God bless you. Let's welcome Pastor Casey Sitter. Amen. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's an honor, a privilege to be with you again this morning. I, I know it's hard for Pastor Ron to give up his pulpit. It's hard for any senior pastor. I've, I've been a senior pastor for almost 25 years. It's hard to give up your pulpit. And so I treat this as a tremendous honor, a tremendous uh, privilege, and I thank him. And, you know, we, as we sang this morning, we serve the God of the impossible. Amen? He can do anything. Amen? Wow. Youth had a great time at Hot Hearts. You know, I, I, agree with, I agree with Pastor Mike. This is a great church, an awesome church. We have an awesome pastor. We have an awesome youth pastor as well. Amen. Awesome worship. Hey. You see the kids going out to Scooterville, the joy and the excitement that those kids have. Man, this is a family church. Amen. It's good to be in the house of the Lord this morning. It's good to serve the living God who hears and answers prayer. The God that can do all things. Amen. But how many of you know he wants to do it through you? He wants to do all things through you. His spirit within you. Hey, he's placed his spirit within us that rivers of living water will flow from our innermost being. Amen. He is so good. He is so good. Well, I think about 57 years. Pastor Mike told us in the green room before service that he had offered Kathy a 57 Chevy for an anniversary present. Hey, how about a 57 Strat for yourself? That would be okay, yeah, yeah. <laughs> that, I mean, that's a wonderful testimony. Let's give him a hand again this morning. What a testimony. Yeah. It's a testimony of God's grace, of his mercy, of his goodness. And, uh, you know, we asked a few questions in their first service. I don't know how he does it. I don't know why he does it, but I know that he does. Amen? And uh, I'm a pretty observant guy. Uh, and I think as, as we go up, Dana and I, we've been married for 32 years, coming on 33 here. And we learn to observe things, don't we? We observe things. And, and especially, you know, you've been married that long, and, and we had two daughters. Uh, so, I, you know, I, I lived in a home with a, with a wife and two daughters, and I had to become observant. I, was, I wasn't military trained like Pastor Ron or some of these other men, you know, how they're trained militarily to, to know what's going on around them all the time. You know, you know when, when, when you're with Pastor Ron, he's aware of what's going on around him all the time. He's been trained in the military to do that. Well, after 32 years of marriage, I got trained to be aware of what's going on. You know, when there's something different with the hair, a change or a style, you know, you don't, you don't say, what did you do to your hair? Or what happened to your face? Or, you know, man, you, you know, you, we've, we've, we've learned, we, 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 get to, we get a grasp of things that we know. And, and so, you know, I, I, I asked these questions this morning, uh, you know, how, we don't know how he does it, we don't know why he does it. And sometimes I think about my wife, I don't know how she can love me. I don't know why she does but I know that she does. Donna and I love you. I love you. And I'm looking forward to another 15 years. We get to whatever it is to 57. That's going to be great. 20, 25, another 25 to 57. Somebody help me with my math here. Wow. That's a great thing. That's a great thing. Amen. Well, this morning's message is called Bernoulli's Principle. Yeah. Bernoulli's Principle. How many of you know what Bernoulli's principle is? How many of you don't have a clue? Come on, raise your hands. Don't be shy. If you don't know what Bernoulli's principle is, that's okay. Raise your hands. 
Okay, because by the end of the service, you'll understand Bernoulli's principle and, and what it means. Don't go looking through your concordance. You won't find him in the, in the back, you know. He's not, he won't find him. In, I don't care if it's New King James or King James or, you know, New American Standard or NSV or whatever you have. You won't find Bernoulli in the Bible, okay? Some of you are going to get out your smartphones or your devices. You're going to Google and find out what, who, who this Bernoulli guy is. But that, that's okay. That's okay. But we'll find out throughout this message what, what this principle is and why, why it applies to us today in the, in, in, in the kingdom. Um, can I ask you another question? How many of you here, men or ladies, young or old, doesn't matter who you are, how many of you would say that you're proficient in the kitchen? That you know your way around the kitchen? Come on, don't be shy. You're, you're men, ladies, doesn't matter, young or old, whoever, teens, children, you know, you, you would raise your hand and say, hey, man, I, I'm good in the kitchen. I know my way around the kitchen. I could cook things up from scratch. You don't need Betty Crocker. You don't need Duncan Hines. You know, if you've got the flour and you've got the eggs and you've got the baking soda and the salt and the sugar and all that stuff, hey, you could whip up a cake like that. How many? Come on. Raise your hands. Angel food cake? Oh, yeah. A oh, yeah? Angel food cake? That seven-minute frosting? You know, the one you take, what does it take, about 12 egg whites in it and, and a bunch of sugar and it's just creamy and smooth. Hey, hey, you had that, Marcus? Angel, oh man, you got to have angel food cake. Hey, angel food cake, so it's awesome. How many of you here, you think you could do that? Come on. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. June 20th is my birthday, okay? <laughs> angel food cake is my favorite. Mm. Well, we're going to look this morning... As I said, I'm, I'm observant. I've learned to become observant. One thing I observed last week, Sunday during communion, Pastor Ron made a very profound statement. It was simple, but it was very profound. He stood before us as we were partaking of communion, or about to partake of it, and he held the emblems in his hand. He had the cup and he had the bread. And he said this, I don't know how he does it, but I know that he does. What a proclamation of faith. I don't know how he does it, but I know that he does. And that's what I want to speak about this morning. I want to speak about that. We don't have to know how he does it. We don't have to know why he does it. But we just know that he does, that he is a miracle-working God. He is the God of the impossible. He is the God that can do all things. And we can do all things through Christ who dwells within us. His Spirit who dwells within us will empower us and enable us to do all things. And so we're going to look at some scripture this morning on this first point of you don't have to know how God does it. We're going to talk about the manna from heaven. Are you familiar with the story of God providing for the children of Israel? Amen? You know, they had been out of, across the Red Sea. They'd come out of, through, into the wilderness. They'd been there really a short time, not very long. And they began to hunger for the, the bread and the meat and the food that was provided for them in Egypt. They began to a little bit of grumbling and complaining. And the Lord spoke to Moses, and we're going to read a few scriptures. We won't read the whole thing, but we'll pick out some of the key scriptures here in Exodus chapter 16 of God's provision of this manna from heaven. Manna from heaven. Angel's food we talk about. You know, angel food. Hey. Manna from heaven. God's miraculous provision. You see, God wanted to declare to the children of Israel, he was a covenant-keeping, covenant-making God. He had made covenant with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He was their God. And he was willing to stretch forth his hand and show himself strong on their behalf, that he would provide for their needs, that he would meet their needs. And in Exodus here, chapter 16, we'll begin reading in verse 4 and 5. It says, Then the Lord said to Moses, Behold, I will rain bread from heaven for you, and the people shall go out and gather a certain quota every day, that I may test them, whether they will walk in my law or not. And it shall be on the sixth day that they shall prepare what they bring in, and it shall be twice as much as they gather daily. Now, the reason that he didn't want them to gather on the seventh day, it was a day of rest. So every day they would gather this manna that rained down from heaven, this miraculous provision. Every day they would go out and gather it for six days. But on the sixth day they would gather twice as much. Twice as much. And it would last till the seventh day, and they could prepare it. It was God's miraculous provision for them. Miraculous provision. And I can imagine the stories that have been told, because it says in Scripture as we read on, that the children of Israel ate manna for 40 years in the wilderness. Now, how many of you witnessed a miracle today? How many of you witnessed a miracle today? 
I believe that God does tremendous miracles in our lives each and every day. And sometimes it's like, whew, we don't even acknowledge it. Hey? Yeah. So here's the children of Israel. This miraculous provision for them. For 40 years in the wilderness, every day God provides for their needs. Every day God reminds them that he is their God, that he is the living God who hears and answers prayer. Every day God reminds them that he's a miraculous, miracle-working God, that he has cut covenant with them, that he will never leave them and never forsake them. The provision is there for them every day. And I just imagine, you know, this family, you know, mom and dad and little Mordecai and Jaime going out to collect the manna, and they collect an omer for each of them, and, and here they are, and they say, you know, how does this work, mom? How does this work, dad? You know, I don't know how God does it, but I know that he does. Amen? Can you imagine? Can you put yourself in their, in their sandals this morning and, and, and think about this for a minute? So here they are. He's providing the manna from heaven. And, and, and we're going to read on here in, in verse 16. It says, This is the thing which the Lord has commanded, that every man gather it according to each one's need, one omer for each person, according to the number of persons that every man take for those who are in his tent. And so the children of Israel do so. They follow God's command. And, you know, they had to learn to, they had to, learn to walk in this. Some of them would gather too much, and it would breed worms and stink. It would rot on them. You know, some of them would go out on the seventh day trying to look, and there was not, you know, like, oh, you know, like, oh, come on. But eventually they, they, they began to walk in it and, and trust in God's miraculous provision. You know, this is God's miraculous provision each and every day. Mm. Each and every day. So God gave them instructions in verse 23. Exodus 16, verse 23. Then he said to them, This is what the Lord has said. Tomorrow is a Sabbath rest, a holy Sabbath to the Lord. Bake what you will bake today and boil what you will boil. And lay up for yourselves all that remains to be kept until morning. So they laid it up till morning as Moses commanded. And it did not stink, nor were there any worms in it. See, this, was, this, is, this is just incredible to me. You know, if, if they gathered too much during the six days, it would breed worms and stink. But on, the, but on the sixth day, they could gather more than they needed for the seventh, and it would last, and it would be perfect. Okay? Again, God showing that he was a miracle-working God, that he is their God, the God who can do anything, the God who does all things, the God of the impossible. Amen? But there's one more thing here. For those of you who, let's see your hands. You're proficient in the kitchen. Okay? Now, now come on, hold them up high. Don't be shy. You know a thing or two about the kitchen, how it works, right? Okay, keep your hands up because I'm going to read something here. I'll, 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 I'm going to re uh, review verse 23. Then he said to them, this is what the Lord has said. Tomorrow is a Sabbath rest, a holy Sabbath to the Lord. Bake what you will bake today and boil what you will boil. But if you go back to verse 21, it says, so they gathered it every morning, every man according to his need, and when the sun became hot, it melted. You guys got your hands up? How does that work, Jana? Huh? How can you bake what you bake and boil what you boil? How does that work? How can you bake something that will melt in the sun? How can you boil something that will melt in the sun? Now, you, you know I'm a Canadian. We've got lots of ice and snow. My wife's never tried to make me an ice cube, you know, sandwich or fr fry up an ice or, or, you know, boil some snow. I mean, it just doesn't work. We, we, we know it doesn't work. So how can you boil something? How can you bake something that will melt in the sun? Anybody? We don't know how he does it. But it's a miracle. Amen? Because we serve a miracle working God. Amen? Every day. Listen, you know, we, we, we read this story and we just think, oh, that's a nice passage of Scripture. But we have to understand, every day the children of Israel were faced with, their, with this provision from God. They were blessed with this provision from God. And he proved to them that he was a miracle working God day after day after day after day after day that he had cut covenant with them, that he would never leave them, never forsake them. He proved himself to them over and over again that he was the living God who would provide for their needs. 
miraculously. I don't know how he does it. I don't know how he does it. And I can imagine this, these little children, you know, Mom, how does, how can, it melts in the, it melts in the sun. How can you cook it? I don't know how he does it. But I just know that he does. Amen. Isn't that good to know? You don't have to know how he does it. But you just know that he does. Amen. Now I want to give you something for free this morning. In verse 35, it says, The children of Israel ate manna 40 years until they came into an inhabited land. They ate manna until they came to the border of the land of Canaan. For 40 years, God provided for them miraculously. Over and over and over again. Now I asked you earlier, how many of you have seen a miracle today? Not too many raised your hands. But I believe we see miracles every day. I believe God does miraculous provisions for us every day. And sometimes it gets to the place where we've become so familiar with the things of God, we no longer acknowledge the miraculous in our lives. Do you think that could have happened to the children of Israel? Do you think that could have happened? You know, people have been, you know, kind of teasing Dana and I since we got down here because... Uh, We've been to this certain restaurant multiple times daily. And last Wednesday, I mean Wednesday night, you know, I, I, I was asked to, to speak the Wednesday service while Pastor Ron was in San Antonio doing this conference. And then I find out that the youth are loading up the, you know, the vehicles and heading off to this certain restaurant again. And it's like, man, well, we got there a little, we got there after service. They had already cleared out. But, hey, I didn't miss out. But, you know, you get used to something over and over and over again. And here's the, this, here's the thing. This is what I, uh, I just want to throw this in for free. I want you to see what happened to the children of Israel. In Numbers 21 and verse 5, again, they're grumbling and complaining. And the people spake against God and against Moses, why have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? For there is no food and no water, and our soul loathes this worthless bread. Oh, and that cuts my heart. That once what held them in awe and high esteem and this miraculous provision of their mighty God who provided for them and met their needs on a daily basis, who did miracle signs and wonders right before their very eyes, this manna that they could bake and boil yet would melt and the sun that was provided them for a daily basis for their nutrition and sustenance. After 40 years, it just was worthless bread. Church, let's never get so dull to the things of God. Let's never get so dull to God's daily provision that it no longer has that wow factor. Amen? Philip Yancey, well-known uh, author, writes this article in Christian Today magazine. He tells about the time that his wife and him went to visit this geyser. I think it's uh, Old Faithful. Right? Old Faithful. And so they're sitting in this dining room overlooking Old Faithful, and there's lots of tourists there, and they've got these great big windows, you know, so uh, you can see out from the dining room and see Old Faithful. And there's a digital clock on the wall giving you the countdown of when Old Faithful is going to spout off. And as the countdown, as the clock goes nearer, 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 you know, people are getting ready. They're getting their cameras out. They're checking their phones. They're making sure that everything's ready. And when the countdown gets to zero, people get up from their tables, he says, and they rush to the windows, and there they are. Old Faithful spouts off, and there's oohs and ahs, and wow, look at that. And the flashes are going, and cameras are taking pictures, and everything's going on. You know, it's like it's really an exciting time. But the busboys, the waitresses, and the waiters... They just go about their business, clearing the tables, arranging knives, filling glasses. I mean, they've seen it before. They've seen it before. And to them, it had absolutely held no interest to them at all. Old Faithful had lost its power to impress them. Dana and I lived in Nova Scotia. I don't know if anybody here has ever been to Nova Scotia. But in Nova Scotia, hey, yeah, yeah, right on. In Nova Scotia, we, we lived in a community called Bible Hill. Uh, north of Truro, Nova Scotia. And there's one thing that's very unique about that area. There's a, a river that flows from the Bay of Fundy. 
into the Bay of Fundy. But when the tide comes in, when the tide comes in, the water comes in so high that it actually looks like it's reversing the flow of the river. They call it the tidal bore. The tidal bore. Because the water rises up, and you can see the river going this direction, and then the water comes over it, and it's coming back. And they call it the tidal bore. It looks, it looks like it's reversed the flow of the river. And so we, you know, we are excited. We want to see this. We're going down to see the tidal bore. We ran into some locals, and they asked for directions. They kind of smiled and said, oh, you're going to the total bore. To them, because they'd seen it before. It was just the total bore. Church, let's never get to the place where the miraculous, where God's daily provision for our needs no longer holds that wow factor in our lives. He is the living God who hears and answers prayer. Who hears and answers prayer. Amen. He does not change. Amen. Malachi 3.6 says, For I am the Lord, I do not change. You know, Hebrews 13.8, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He's the same living God who hears and answers prayer. He's a miracle working God. We don't have to know how he does it, but we know that he does. Amen. Amen. Number two, you don't have to know why God chooses to do it the way he does. But isn't that the thing? Sometimes we just want to know why. Have you ever asked, why, God? Why, God? Why? 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 And I want to look at some scripture today in 2 Kings chapter 5, a well-known story. I'm sure you're familiar with it. The story of Naaman. Naaman, let me tell you this as we begin. Naaman almost forfeited his miracle of healing because of why. Because of why. Naaman was a commander in the army of Syria. We'll read in Scripture that Naaman was a, uh, was a powerful man, and the Lord had brought about great victories through Naaman. The Lord had given Naaman power and authority, and he commanded Syria's army. And Naaman was held in high esteem, even by the king of Syria. He, he held Naaman in high esteem. He had great, wrought great victories. He had, had done tremendous triumphs. He, had, had, had a, you know, a, he was legendary in Syria. Well, we'll read it in verse 1 of Naaman, uh, of 2 Kings chapter 5, it says, Now Naaman, commander of the army of the king of Syria, was a great and honorable man in the eyes of his master, because by him the Lord had given victory to Syria. He was also a mighty man of valor, but a leper. See, with all of his exploits, with all of these things that he had done, with all of these great victories he had won, there was still that thing hanging over him. He was a leper. And the Syrians had gone out on raids and had brought back captive a young girl from the hand of Israel. She waited on Naaman's wife. Then she said to her mistress, If only my master were with the prophet who is in Samaria, for he would heal him of his leprosy. Can you imagine getting excited about that? Hey? Then Naaman went in and told his master, saying, Thus and thus said the girl who is from the land of Israel. Then the king of Syria said, Go now, and I will send a letter to the king of Israel. So he departed and took with him ten talents of silver, six thousand shekels of gold, and ten changes of clothing. Then he brought the letter to the king of Israel, which said, Now be advised, when this letter comes to you, that I have sent Naaman my servant to you, that you may heal him of his leprosy. Wow. I mean, he puts the king of Israel on the spot, eh? You know what? I've sent him to you. Now you be advised that you may heal him of his leprosy. And it happened when the king of Israel read the letter that he tore his clothes and said, Am I God to kill and make alive that this man sends him a man to me to heal him of his leprosy? Therefore, please consider and see how he seeks a quarrel with me. See, he's looking at himself. He should have been looking to the God of Israel. So it was, verse 8, so it was when Elisha, the man of God, heard that the king of Israel had torn his clothes then he sent to the king, saying, Why have you torn your clothes? Please, let him come to me, and he shall know that there is a prophet in Israel. Then Naaman went with his horses and chariot, and he stood at the door of Elisha's house. And Elisha sent a messenger to him, saying, Go and wash in the Jordan seven times, and your flesh shall be restored to you, and you shall be clean. Now, how many of you know that if you were given specific instructions from the Lord... 
to be healed of leprosy or healed of whatever it may be or delivered from this or that or the other thing, that you would do it. I mean, you know, we, we, thank God that we have the rest of the story here. We, we can read the book and we know, right? But put yourself in Naaman's shoes or his sandals this morning for a bit. You know, he's come from Syria. He's come down from Israel. He's heard this story, this legend, that there is a man of God who can heal you of your leprosy. And so he's probably, you know, well, we know in Scripture, it, it tells us if we read on, that he's imagining how this is going to happen. Oh, the man of God's going to come out, and he's going he's to wave his hands all over his place, and, and he's going to lay his hands on this, and he's going to call on the God of Israel, and it's going to happen like this, and, and you know, I'm going to be healed of my leprosy. I'm going to be healed and set free. Well, he gets there, and he gets directions to Elijah's house, and Elijah doesn't even come out of his house. He sends his servant and says, you know, go jip, d- jump in the Jordan. Wow. Are you serious? Well, let's read Naaman's response here. Let's read about it. Again, 2 Kings chapter 5, verse 11. But Naaman became furious and went away and said, Indeed, I said to myself, He will surely come out to me and stand and call on the name of the Lord his God and wave his hand over the place and heal the leprosy. Are not the Abana and the far, far, the rivers of Damascus, better than all the waters of Israel? Could I not wash in them and be clean? So he turned and went away in a rage. Why? Why should I jump in the Jordan? Why should I dip in the Jordan? We've got better rivers in Syria. Who do you, who, this is just a farce. I came here to be healed. I brought clothing. I brought gold. I brought silver. I brought all these gifts. And you won't even come out of your house and lay your hands on me. You won't even call on your God. You won't wait. I mean, he expected this great, big, powerful demonstration. And yet God was going to demonstrate his power if he would simply obey the word of the Lord. Now remember, when I was here in June, when Dana and I were visiting in June, there was tremendous music ministry. There there always is. We're blessed here with powerful praise and worship. And there was an altar call, and Pastor Vaughn was ministering to, the, to those who came up here, and this altar was full of people. And Pastor Vaughn said something that was, again, very, you know, very profound. He said, don't let the devil tell you that you don't receive anything if you don't feel it. I'm going to lay hands on you. Some of you, some of you will feel something. Some of you will. But if you don't feel anything, if you don't get a goosebump, or if you don't get a tickle, or if you don't fall down, don't let the enemy lie to you and tell you that God didn't meet your need, that God didn't re- re- that you didn't receive anything. Hey, it's spirit that ministers unto spirit, and sometimes our flesh reacts, sometimes it doesn't. And see, Naaman had this concept that you know Elijah had to come out, he had to call, he had to wave his hand, and listen, I don't in any way. I don't disregard the manifestations of the move of God and the Spirit of God. But if it doesn't happen the way you planned or thought it should in your preconceived ideas, don't say why. Just know that God can and he does and he will do it the way he chooses to do it. Amen. See, Naaman almost forfeited the very miracle he so desperately needed because of why. Why? Why don't you do it the way I thought you should? Why, why should I go in this Jordan River? We've got better rivers back home. Why? And the very miracle he needed, if not for some taking some, heeding the advice of his well-meaning servants that had come with him, they, you know, they said to him, if you read on the story, you know, if the prophet, if the man of God had told you to do something big, would you not have done it? So why not just obey this simple thing? They brought him to his senses. You know the, how the story ends. He goes to the Jordan, he dips in the Jordan seven times. He comes up completely restored, completely healed. Who gets the glory? Wasn't the king of Israel. It wasn't even Elisha. It was a living God who hears and answers prayer. But he almost forfeited the very miracle he needed because of the question, why? 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 You see, it... I don't, in Canada, there's a, a few years ago, Burger King had this slogan, have it your way. I don't know if you're familiar with that or not. But let me tell you, this ain't Burger King. And you can't have it your way. It's God's way. 
whether you know and can understand how he does it, whether you know or can understand why he chooses to do it the way he does, let's let God be God. Amen. Amen. He's pretty good at being God. He's been doing it for a long time. And he's good at it. Amen? He's good at it. 2 Corinthians 5, 7 says, For we walk by faith, not by sight. We walk by faith, not by what we see, not by what we hear, not by our circumstances that are around us. We walk in faith. We know that God can. We know that he will. And we trust him. Amen? You know, the Apostle Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, when he came in writing to the, to the church in Corinth, he said, I didn't come to you with powerful preaching. I didn't come to you with great wisdom. I didn't come to you, you know, with, with a silver-tongued orator. I just came with fear and in much trembling. And I determined that to preach, I was going to preach nothing but Christ and him crucified. But he says, I was with you. I was with you. I preached Christ and him crucified. And in powerful demonstrations, Powerful demonstrations of miracles, signs, and wonders. Sometimes we get caught up looking, looking for those great demonstrations. We, we want to get our eyes on the demonstrations. We have to get our eyes on the God. It's his power. It's his anointing. You know, demonstrations of powerful are powerful demonstrations. Mm. So I asked you, how many of you know Bernoulli's principle? How many have Googled it? Ha-ha. Uh-huh. Bernoulli's Principle, written by Daniel Bernoulli in 1738. It's it's in regards to fluid dynamics. Bernoulli's Principle states that an increase in the speed of a fluid occurs simultaneously with a decrease in pressure or a decrease in the fluid's potential energy. The principle is named after Daniel Bernoulli, who published it in his book, Hydrodynamica, in 1738. Isn't that cool? Aren't you glad you know that? Yeah, are you glad you know that? It's about drag, lift. It's, it, it's the principle behind the, the flow of the air over the top of the wing of an airplane versus the flow of the air under the wing. And because the wing is curved, that flow has to go faster on the top than it does underneath. And then you get the force, and, and it overcomes the drag, and it creates lift. It's the scientific principle of why an airplane flies. Now, for those of you who didn't know Bernoulli's principle, how many of you have ever flown on a plane? What? You actually got on a plane without knowing Bernoulli's principle? How dare you? Boy, you're people of faith, aren't you? I mean, you didn't know Bernoulli's principle. You didn't know why the plane would rise. You didn't know why it would overcome the weight and all compensate, you know, with how drag and lift and force and all that stuff applies. Were you even questioned about it when you got on the plane? Did you, did you have to sign a waiver? Did you have to say, you know, I, I understand Bernoulli's principle. I know why this plane will fly. Therefore, I can get on it. I, you know, I know how it works. I know why it works. No, it's ridiculous, isn't it? You just trusted that that plane will fly. Even though you didn't know anything about Bernoulli's principle, you didn't know how it works, you didn't know why it works, you got on that plane trusting it to get you to your destination, to get off the ground. You know, see, I want to apply that today. We may not know how God does it. We may not know why God chooses to do the way he does. But we know that we know that we know that our God can that he is able, that he is a miracle working God who hears and answers prayer. And that's point number three. We just know that God can and does. Jeremiah wrote in 32, 17, All our God, behold, you have made the heavens and the earth by your great power and outstretched arm. There is nothing too hard for you. Isn't that good to know? That the creator of all heaven and earth, the sea and all their sources... There's nothing too hard for our God. Amen? Nothing too hard for him. We may not know how he's going to do it. We may not know why he's going to do it the way he does it. But we just know that he can and that he will. And that there's nothing too difficult for our unstoppable, immovable, all-powerful King of kings and Lord of lords. Hallelujah. Mm. See, he's a miracle-working God. 
And I want to share a, I want to share a testimony this morning. And Pastor Ken, you may, you may know this couple. Uh, a couple named Doris, Earl and Doris Jellison. Remember Earl and Doris? They were pastors of a church in Riverview Community Church. It was called Riverview Church in Frenchman Butte, Saskatchewan, a little community in northern Saskatchewan. Well, Earl and Doris had retired and stayed in the community, turned the church over to a young pastor and his wife and family, and they had come in and had taken over, and they had helped them through this transition and had been a real asset to the church, even in their retirement. You know, like, like we have right, right here with Pastor Mike and Kathy, with Pastor Vaughn, hey? There's still something that these men and women of God have to offer to the church, amen? And so Pastor Earl and Doris had been in this church for a number of years, and this young pastor and his family had come in. They were the lead pastors. They were working. Things were going great. The you know, Spirit of God was moving. People were getting saved. The community was being touched by a move of God. Well, sadly, this new pastor was killed in an accident. And Dana and I began to go up there and, and work with, with this church. And for about six months to eight months, we became their interim pastors to help them through the grieving process before we would set in a new pastor. Well, one morning, Earl comes into the office of the church, and he once he's, he could tell he's very serious. He's got this countenance upon him that's very serious. And he, he sits down, and, and, and you got to understand, I'm, I'm getting ready to go out. The service is just about to start, but he comes in. And he says, Pastor, I need to speak with you a little bit. Uh, I've gotten a bad report. Uh, Doris has been diagnosed with terminal cancer. And I want to talk to you about doing the funeral. And, you know, the service is about to start in about 10 minutes. But he's already making funeral arrangements because of the diagnosis that they've received. And so I said, well, you know, we'll set up some time. We'll speak about this. And in my heart of hearts, I'm saying, well, let's not give up on God. Let's not give up on God. So I can't even tell you what I preached about that Sunday morning. I, I don't know. I, it, it was a number of years ago. But I do know this, that towards the end of the service, I knew I was going to call her up and ask if we could lay hands on her. And I'd been through all of this stuff in my mind, rehearsing it, you know, the prayer of faith, and, you know, call upon the elders of the church, and the prayer of faith will heal the sick, and, you know, let them ask in faith with no doubting, and for he who doubts is like a wave of the sea that is, you know, to and fro and back and forth. And I'm thinking, Lord, uh, I'm going to call her up and ask for prayer, but... Obviously, they're not in faith because they're, they're making funeral arrangements. And how can we be in agreement and, and all of this stuff? And it, but I just felt really strongly impressed that I still had to call her up and pray for her. So at the end of the service, we call her up, and, and she comes forward, and she's just a wonderful, sweet little old lady. But, you know, you can tell that this has taken a toll on her. And, and she's pretty much handed it in. So Dana comes up with me, and, and we pray the Word of God over her. It's just as simple as that. We just prayed what we knew how to pray. I didn't feel any, you know, surge of power or electricity or anything going through me. I just prayed in obedience to the Word of God. She didn't feel anything. She didn't shake. She didn't rattle. She didn't roll. She didn't, you know. She, she, just, she just thanked us for her prayer and went back to her seat. Well, the following week, she was to be at the university hospital for these tests, and they were going to see what they could, if, they, if, if possibly, if it hadn't advanced too far, that they could do some surgery and maybe remove something, make her more comfortable. So she's in this pre-op department, and they're doing all these pre-op tests, and they, they do some tests, and they send her back to her room, and they said, you know, a doctor will come in to you, and, you know, just wait here for a few minutes as we check these results of these tests, and we'll let you know what we're going to do. And the minutes, you know, they just drag on and drag on and drag on, and Pretty soon it's 15 minutes, 20 minutes, half an hour, an hour. And in her mind, she tells me, she told me the story that she, she's sitting there and she's thinking, well, it's, there's nothing they can do. It's progressed so far. The doctors, they've, they've got the results and it's taken them so long they, that they've, you know, there's nothing they can do. I mean, the enemy was just running this through her mind. He was having his way. Finally, the, there's a knock on the door and doctor comes in. 
The doctor says to her, Mrs. Jellison, I don't understand what's happened to you. I don't know how this can be. We've run every test. We know how to run. We've done everything that we can do. We can't find a single, a single cell of cancer in your body. He says to her, at your age, you will never die of cancer. You know, you might get hit by a bus, but cancer will not kill you. And she, I mean, she, she's in disbelief. You know, and it's one of those things, I mean, we serve the living God who hears and answers prayer. And we think that we have to have all our faith just perfect. We think that we've got to have all our ducks in a row. We've got to have everything lined up, all our T's crossed, our I's dotted. We've got to have everything just so and so, just right. But I tell you, we just have to let God be God. We don't know how he does it. We don't know why he chooses to do it the way he does, but we know that he can. We know that he is able. We know that he's the living God who hears and answers prayer, that he can do all things. Oh, Lord God, behold, you have made the heavens and the earth by your great power and outstretched arm. There is nothing too hard for you. Amen. There's nothing too hard for our God. Ephesians 3.20 says, Now to him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we could ask or think according to the power that works in us. We sang about it this morning. That power that works in us is the same spirit that raised Christ from the dead. Amen. He inhabits you. He's chosen to inhabit these earthen vessels by his spirit. It's the spirit of God that dwells in us. And that's the same power, the same spirit that raised Christ from the dead. And by that spirit, he is exceedingly able to do abundantly above all that we ask or think according to that power that works in us. Amen. That's why we're saying I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Why? Why? Because it's the spirit of the living God, the creator of all heaven and earth, the sea, and all their sources that dwells within us. Mm. Amen. We serve a living God. He's alive and well. We may not know how he does it. We may not know why he chooses to do it the way he does. But we know that he can, and he is able, and he is willing. Let me tell you, he is willing. Amen. One of my favorite scriptures is from 2 Chronicles 16 and verse 9. The first part of this verse says, For the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth to show himself strong on behalf of those whose heart is loyal to him. Glory. Amen? Amen? Yeah, glory! Amen. See, I, I get this mental image. I get this mental image in my mind. Of, of the Lord, you know, and he's seated on his throne in heaven. And, and, and you know, there's the Father. He's looking out, and, and, and he's looking over the earth. And our, our King of kings, our Lord of lords, the Lord Jesus, our great high priest, whoever lives to make intercession on our behalf, who's praying for our needs right now, interceding for us. They're looking out over across the earth, and there he says, the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth to show himself strong on behalf of those whose heart is loyal to him. He's looking for an occasion to prove himself. Just like he did for those people of Israel with the manna. He's looking for an occasion to show himself strong on your behalf. And it says, for those whose hearts are loyal to him. It doesn't say whose faith is perfect, who's does God everything lined up in a row. It says whose, whose hearts are loyal to him. And if you had a hunger and a thirst to know this God, this creator, this king of kings, and this Lord of lords, oh, this amazing God. You know, I told you earlier, I, I've been married 32 years. I don't know sometimes how, how Dana fell in love with me. I don't know why she did. But I'm so glad she did, and I know that she loves me. I know that she loves me. And you may be seated here this morning and you think, you know, you talk about God, you talk about the creator of all heaven and earth, the sea and all their sources, and who am I? How could God love me? Why would he love me? Well, I want to tell you this morning, he loves you because you're made in his image. Genesis 1.26 
It says, God said, let us make man in our image. In the image of God, he created the male and female. He created them. So you're, you're made in his image, and he loves you. He loves you. He loves you. This unstoppable God, this, this creator of all heaven and earth, the sea and all their sources, this King of kings and this Lord of lords, this covenant-keeping, miracle-working God loves you, and he knows who you are. He knows what you're going through right now in life. And he longs to stretch forth his hand to save, to heal, to deliver, to set free, to show himself strong on your behalf like he did for the children of Israel, like he did for Naaman. Oh, don't get caught up in the whys. Don't get caught up in the hows. Just be fully persuaded that we know that God can. See, let me close with this. You've already been part. For those of us, for those of us who know him, for those of us who have been saved and set free, we sang about death being arrested. We've already partaken of one of the greatest miracles ever. Where our lives have been transformed from the kingdom of darkness, translated out of that kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of the son of his love of light. I would be amiss this morning after bragging on God and telling you how good God is and his mercy and his kindness and his goodness that if there was someone here who didn't have personal relationship with him, You see, the time will come when we'll all stand before the Lord. The Bible is very clear. There'll be those who say, well, Lord, didn't we do this in your name? Didn't we do that in your name? We've cast out demons in your name. We've done miracles in your name. We did this. But he'll say, I never knew you. The Lord wants to have personal relationship with each and every one of us. Well, listen, at Church on the Rock, we're not talking about religion. We're talking about relationship. He longs to have personal relationship with each and every one of us here today. You may say, Pastor Casey, I don't know how God could love me. I don't know why he would. I can tell you this. He gave his only begotten son that whosoever would believe in him should not perish but have everlasting life. It's the greatest love, the greatest gift, the greatest life that one could ever have. When death was arrested, our lives began. Your life can begin today. If you're here today and you don't know that you know that you know that if you were to die today and go to heaven, would you lift your hand? Don't be shy. Would you lift your hand? Father, we thank you. We thank you for each soul that's represented here today. We thank you, Father, this is a family of believers. Family of believers that you have called and set apart for such a time as this to be bold witnesses of your love and of your mercy and of your grace. Lord God, that you have called and set apart this church to be a testimony, a testimony here in Southeast Texas and beyond, Father God, throughout the world of your love and of your mercy, of your grace, to win souls and to make disciples. That at the name of Jesus, when every knee bows and every tongue confesses that Jesus Christ is Lord, Father God, I thank you that the kingdom will be expanded, that the kingdom will grow. And Father God, that many will see and fear and put their trust in you, the living God who hears and answers prayer. Father, we trust you today. We trust you with our future. We trust you with our tomorrows. We trust you, Father, with our needs, with our circumstances, Father. Whatever we're going through, Father God, we know that you are bigger than our circumstances. That you are well able, that you can do exceedingly, abundantly, above all that we could ask or think. Because you can do more than we can think of to ask, Father. We trust you, Father God. You're the living God who hears and answers prayer. Father, we'll not be ashamed. We will boldly declare the gospel of Jesus Christ. We give you the glory. We give you all of the honor. 
And we give you all of the praise today in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, as you're dismissed this morning, I want to encourage you, if you need prayer for anything, please come forward. Allow us and the prayer team to pray for you. You don't have to know how. You don't have to know why. But just know that God can and God does and God will. Amen. As Pastor Ron said, if go in peace, not in pieces. If you're in pieces, you come forward. Let us pray for you. God can put you together again. Go in peace. Be blessed. Have a wonderful Sunday afternoon. Thank you all very much.